All right, so uh, my first video got cut off, I think, like mid-sentence. I had some issues with my recording device here, but uh, the place that I left off, I was talking about this interpretation of the line integral. Um, you can interpret it as the area of one side of this curtain here. Uh, it's Honestly, it's not a very good interpretation, even though it's technically correct. It doesn't really give us any insight into what a line integral is used for. Now, line integrals can be used for lots of different things. There's lots of applications of them, and they really just boil down to what the function f of x, y represents. Um, so we'll look at one application in a moment, but uh, I want to start by um, looking at how we even uh, compute these line integrals. So um, again, we came up with um, uh, the differential ds equals square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt, and substituting that in for the ds here, as well as substituting in x of t and y of t from our parameterization in for the x and the y here, gives us this formula here for computing a line integral. So if you notice, the things that we need are a parameterization for our curve, which is where x of t and y of t come from, the derivatives of each of these functions with respect to t, which will be used here, um, and then the a, b, notice the line integral becomes a, uh, an integral of a single variable t, a definite integral, so we have limits of integration as well. a and b are the um, upper and lower bounds on t in, the, in our definition of our parameterization. So the very first thing you want to do anytime you're evaluating a line integral, unless it's given to you from the beginning, is determine a parameterization for the curve that you're integrating over. So um, let's start with this example. We want to evaluate the line integral um, of x ds along the curve c, where c is described this way. It's the arc of the curve or the parabola y equals x squared from the point negative 1, 1 to positive 1, 1. It's generally a good idea to um, <clears throat> sketch the curve before you do anything else. So it's a parabola. Uh, this is the point 1, 1. This is the point negative 1, 1. Put in some labels here. Okay. Now, one thing that's going to be really important, it's not going to, um, it's not going to really play into how we evaluate this integral so much, um, or kind of, but it, it's going to be much more important a little bit later, is the orientation of a parametrized curve. So notice uh, the order that these are listed in from negative 1, 1 to 1, 1, indicating that negative 1, 1 is an initial point, 1, 1 is a terminal point. That gives an orientation to this curve in the sense that we're starting here, traveling along the curve, and ending here. That orientation is really, really important in some of the things that come up later. Um, but now let's, let's come up with that parametrization. So uh, this curve is given to us in the form of a function. Y is a function of x. Lots of times curves are not given to us in the form of a function, but when they are, they're actually very easy to parametrize. What we do is we choose the independent variable to be our parameter, so that x in this case is equal to t, and then substituting t for x shows us that y would be equal to t squared. So that's my parametrization that I want to use. Um, looking at my uh, method for evaluating a line integral. If I have x and y both as functions of t, which I'll use here and here, I'm also going to need dx dt and dy dt. So I need to evaluate those. Uh, but actually, before I do that, let's determine the um, bounds on t. If x is equal to t, and if I look at the x values uh, as I go from one point to the next, x goes from negative 1 to positive 1. So t would do the same. Oops t is going to go from negative 1 to positive 1. We need to put that down as well because this is going to give us our limits of integration once we move on to the integral part of this. Um, let's get dx dt and dy dt. dx dt uh, would just be 1. dy dt would be 2t, as I can see there. Okay. So to evaluate this integral now, the integral line integral of x ds along c. Well, I make a substitution in my function, so x is equal to t. I have to put a t there. My limits of integration are going to be negative 1 to 1. 
And then that takes care of the first part of this thing up here. I now need to multiply by the ds, which is the square root of the sum of the squares of those two derivatives, dt. So this becomes the square root of dx dt squared, that's 1 squared, plus dy dt squared, which we found here, that's <clears throat> 2t squared. And then I have a dt here now. Okay, next step, integral from negative 1 to 1 um, of t times the square root. This would become 4t squared plus 1 dt. Now there's a couple of ways I can move uh, on to the next step. Um, one, there's a very obvious u substitution I could do here. I could set u equal to 4t squared plus 1. But if you're observant and you remember how to use symmetry in integrals, this can be wrapped up in one very quick step if you notice that 4t squared plus 1 is an even function. Um, the square root of that would also be an even function. t is an odd function. And anytime you have an odd function times an even function, the result is an odd function. So I'm going to say integrand is odd. Now, if you're integrating an odd function over an interval that's symmetric about 0, negative 1 to 1 in this case, the result is always 0. You don't get to use symmetry that often in this course, but when you do, it can help, uh, it, it can help make these problems go a lot faster. Just be careful to make sure you're using it correctly. Okay, so this one ends up coming out to just 0. All right, um, let's take a look at an application of line integrals. Um, the first and probably easiest uh, application to uh, motivate is that of center of mass and mass. So we talked about how double integrals in, the, in chapter 15 can um, give us the center of mass of a lamina as well as the mass of a lamina where the density of that lamina is given as a function of x and y, rho x, y is how we uh, represented that. We could do the same thing in the case of a line integral, it's just that we're not looking at a lamina anymore because we don't integrate over plane regions when we do line integrals, we integrate over curves. So if you want to come up with a natural interpretation for that, the curve can represent some kind of metal wire or something like that bent into the shape of that curve. Following a similar derivation is what we did for center of mass in the previous chapter. Um, we can show that the mass of a wire, which has a linear density function given by rho of xy at the point xy, that's the density of the wire at that point, um, it would be equal to the line integral of your density function ds over the curve representing that wire. Um, notice the similarity between this and finding the mass of a lamina. It's essentially the same idea, just with a new kind of integral. And then also similar to how we found center of mass back in that chapter, we can find the center of mass of a, of a wire um, by evaluating these two integrals, 1 over your mass times the line integral of x rho xy along c, and then similar for y. So. Uh, let's do an example where we're evaluating center of mass. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, a thin wire has the shape of an arc, uh, has the shape of the arc of the unit circle contained in the first quadrant. If the density function for the wire is given by this, kxy, k is some constant here, uh, we want to find the center of mass. So I'm going to sketch this region first. Or sorry, I called it a region. It's not a region. I sketch the curve. The curve we're looking at is um, here, one, negative one. It's the unit circle, but only the part of the unit circle that's in the first quadrant. Okay, so now I need a parameterization for that. Um, the, the natural parameterization that we usually use for a circle, the unit circle in particular, is x equals cosine of t, y equals sine of t. Although in this case, because we only want this portion of the unit circle, um, t represents the radian measure here, and it's going to go from 0 to pi over 2. So I can say this. Okay. Now I also know that I'm going to need dx dt and dy dt. Let's evaluate those. dx dt is equal to negative sine of t, and then dy dt would be cosine of t. <coughs> All right. 
So what I need to do is evaluate a line integral that's going to give me mass first, because I need to know the mass of this wire bent into this shape before I can find center of mass. Um, so the mass is equal to the line integral C of our density function xy um, ds, line integral of that density function along C. In order to evaluate this, I know that my line integral is going to turn into a uh, definite integral, and the limits are going to be given by the limits on my t here, the bounds on my t, 0 to pi over 2. Okay. The function that we're integrating, rho of xy, is given here, kxy. However, we need to make substitutions for x and y so that everything is in terms of t. That means I'm going to change this into k cosine of t sine of t. Okay, And then we need to multiply by the square root of the sum of the squares of dx dt and dy dt. That's going to give me negative sine of t squared plus cosine of t squared dt. Now, it looks much worse than what we started with. However, if you notice, this in here is going to become sine squared plus cosine squared. That's This whole thing is just going to end up equaling 1. So that makes that a lot easier. Then in addition to that, I can pull the k out because it's a constant. And sine times cosine is the same thing as one half times sine of two t. I can use this. I can use the double angle formula for sine here. So simplifying things way down, this becomes k over two out here. And again, this two is because of what I did by converting sine of t, cosine of t into sine of two t. Sine of two t. Here's my limits: zero to pi over two. Dt because that whole thing just went to one. Okay. Um, next up. If I evaluate this integral right here, this is going to become k over 2 times uh, 1 half. Uh, actually, it's negative 1 half. We'll pull the negative out here. Negative 1 half cosine of 2t from 0 to pi over 2. Okay. Um, <clears throat> evaluating this gives me k over 2 which you can work out the arithmetic on that, but that's what that mass comes out to. So now I need to evaluate my x bar and y bar. Um, remember x bar is equal to one over m times the integral of my density function times x along c. Okay, well, one over m, that's reciprocal of my uh, mass, which would be 2 over k then. And again, the curve is parametrized for us, so we're, we're still going to use the same limits of integration, 0 to pi over 2. Now, um, p, rho of xy becomes k cosine of t sine of t, as we had up here. But I'm multiplying that by x, which is cosine of t. So that gives me an extra cosine of t here. All of this put together gives me k cosine squared of t sine of t dt. And again, I'm skipping the step where I'm writing this because we already know that this square root here is going to come out to a 1, so that simplifies things a little bit. Um, notice the k's will cancel. That's important because we don't want k to show up in our answer. Um, that would mean that the center of mass depends on k, which it actually should not. Um, this we can evaluate using a u substitution. So, for example, if I let u equal cosine of t, then du would equal negative sine of t dt. Multiplying both sides by a negative gives me that. So now I have negative 2 integral from 0 to pi over 2. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, u squared du. Okay, um, and then also, oh, you know what, I forgot to change my limits of integration, so I'd better do that. I have to plug in 0 and pi over 2 in for t here to get limits that correspond to u. So if I plug in a 0, that's going to give me a 1. If I plug in a pi over 2, that's going to give me a 0. I can use this negative to flip the order of integration there. 
so that I have 2 integral from 0 to 1 of u squared du. This will come out to 2 thirds. It's a fairly simple integral to evaluate at that point. Now, y bar, if I do the same thing, but this time we're integrating the function y rho of xy ds, the steps are really, really similar, so I'm not going to walk through the entirety of this one. This also comes out to two-thirds. And again, I, I would encourage you to work through this on your own to make sure you're comfortable with these steps, but it's going to be very, very similar to what we just did here. So my center of mass is two-thirds. Two-thirds. I always like to go back and make sure that this is uh, reasonable. So two-thirds... Oops, I don't know why I put a negative one there. Two-thirds, two-thirds is going to be right around here somewhere. That's not quite accurate. It's going to be right around there somewhere. Two-thirds, two-thirds. Now, um, that does seem pretty reasonable if you think about our density function. Uh, K, X, Y, we're in the first quadrant where all of your X's and Y's are positive, which means... Um, the uh, density is going to be greater as x and y are both larger. So if, if this point gets too close to either axis, this density function is going to become relatively small. So this point is an equal distance away from both our x and our y axis. You would expect the point to be kind of far from both axes relative to that wire. So that's kind of what we're seeing here. Um, that's, that's all the time we have for this video. Um, we'll continue this in the next one.